Um, good afternoon, everyone. You are tuned in with us here at Safe Passage for Children of Minnesota's free webinar featuring Mark Fiddler and Alicia Sorensen of Minnesota Foster and Adoptive Families, also known as VINFAP. My name is Stephanie McCorkle, and I am the Safe Passage for Children Operations Manager and Volunteer Coordinator. Our mission here at Safe Passage for Children is to strengthen the Minnesota child welfare system so that children are safe and can reach their full potential. Please visit our website to learn more at safepassageforchildren.org. There you can also sign up for our mailing list, receive our weekly um, emailed blog posts and podcasts. Also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Today's webinar will consist of two parts, the presentation followed by a Q&A time. We ask that you please mute your microphone um, during the presentation until the Q&A time afterwards. After that, feel free to ask questions of our presenters using the chat feature on Zoom, or go ahead and just unmute yourself and um, use your audio, um, either your phone or your computer. Thanks again for being here today, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our Executive Director, Rich Garriman, to tell us more about today's presentation. All right, go ahead, Rich. You all can hear me, right? But um, thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, there was a little freezing of the frame there. Um, so before I introduce our guest for today, let me just uh, mention that the, the next webinar coming up, uh, and it will be the last one for 2021. We're going to take December off, but the next one coming up is going to be uh, Deb Fitzpatrick from the Child Welfare, uh, from Children's Defense Fund. And she is going to talk about the um, Building Back Better Act. Uh, what's in it that relates to families and children, whether it's maybe it'll even be passed by them or what its prospects are for passing. So did you have an idea of all of the, all of the services and benefits that are in there that are going to affect um, people that we, um, that we are working on behalf of? So I'd like to introduce today, um, the, uh, our two guests are Mark Fiedler and uh, Alicia Sorensen. Uh, and they are with MinFAF, which Minnesota, uh, it states foster, Mark? Foster Sorry. and Adoptive Families. Foster and Adoptive. MinFAF is what I'm, Foster and Adoptive Families, which is a new, uh, you know, service that, and Alicia is actually the Executive Director of Moving Mountains, which is one of the first implementations of this idea in Minnesota, so they're going to tell you about that. Uh, Mark is a registered member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians, and Indian is a private practice attorney in Minnesota, specializing in adoption, foster care, third-party custody, and the Indian Child Welfare Act, or ICWA, as most of you know by. And he was named one of the Minnesota Lawyer Attorneys of the Year in 2013. He's a fellow and former trustee of the American Academy of Adoption Attorneys. He's chair of its ICWA committee and is the founding director of the Indian Child Welfare Law Center, for which I think he is uh, often best known. Uh, he's litigated in many areas, including uh, Indian child welfare cases, and that, including in the United States Supreme Court on the landmark case called Adoptive Couple v. Baby Girl. And maybe we'll have you back at some point to talk about that uh, case in particular, Mark. And an appellate in trial courts uh, throughout the United States. And Alicia is the founding director, I believe, of Moving Mountains, and I'm going to let her tell a little bit more about herself and her background. I'll turn it over to you guys. Oh, and to say one more thing, we have, after the presentation, we generally have a, a generous amount of time for Q&A and discussion, so uh, just so you know that's coming. Go ahead, Mark. Okay. Well, uh, thanks for inviting us, uh, Rich. Um, uh, so my name is uh, Mark Fiddler, obviously, and uh, like Rich said, I've been practicing in adoption and foster care for several years. Uh, I'll be candid, it's been about 30 years, and I started out as a public defender in Hennepin County and got to know the, the kind of the underbelly of the, the child welfare system working in Hennepin County. Um, and out of that, I got in, interested in the more of the back side of the system on the adoption side and then went into private practice doing private adoptions. Um, but in between those moments, you know, I founded the uh, Indian Child Welfare Law Center in Minneapolis and um, really got to be very acquainted with the inner workings of child welfare, foster care and adoption. 
And so I've been litigating those cases, representing lots of foster parents and adoptive parents, some children, occasionally a tribe, um, but most of my practice has been uh, recently representing uh, foster and adoptive parents. And so I, um, I had a moment, it was maybe about a year and a half ago, and I had, uh, had a client and she had uh, an adoptive placement agreement with the uh, Commissioner of Human Services to adopt a child. And the county had done relative searches for several years and didn't find any. And so she had this agreement and we wanted to finalize the adoption. And the, the judge said, no, I want you to, I want the county to search for relatives even more. And so the county was ordered to do that. They did it reluctantly. And, um, you know, so, so wouldn't you know, they found a, a shirt tail relative in another state who then moved to Minnesota, got a home study, and long story short, that um, relative got placement uh, over my client uh, who'd had the child four years of his life and was by all professional accounts was bonded and attached. And um, I think uh, livid and outraged, uh, you know, doesn't um, overstate my feelings at all. Um, and so I, you know, after that, I, and I'd had several, a couple more experiences like that that kind of aggregated, uh, you know, over several months last year. And I thought, you know, foster parents, uh, you guys need to unite and become uh, voices for change because this system is just um, not listening to you. I don't, my personal opinion, does, don't believe that it's advocating for the best interests of children. It doesn't pay attention to attachment issues. Um, so I kind of put it out there on some different Facebook groups and said, okay, let you guys, you guys, you need, you need to unite uh, who wants to join me. <laughs> and so uh, you can see on the screen, Kathy, uh, the last name is Gilman, she's waving. She joined me and then a few others joined and we started this process of trying to envision what, what it would look like uh, to form an organization that would uh, become uh, a voice for foster and adoptive families. And that's, that's a pretty grandiose, uh, <laughs> grandiose uh, objective. Um, and so we, uh, we started up, we incorporated last December with the state of Minnesota, filled out a gazillion page application for 501c3 uh, letter of exemption from the IRS. We got that. So we're now uh, a nonprofit uh, charitable organization and we can take donations and grants. Um, we also listed as a lobbying organization. So um, one thing people don't realize about nonprofits is they, they can lobby. It just can't be a substantial part of the, the organization's budget. Um, so we started building this, this thing, up, uh, building it out, as I call it. Um, and one of the first things that we started to get some traction with was uh, the idea of supporting foster closets. So we, our mission, let me just uh, pull up our, um, I've got a little presentation here. Can you guys see this? Yep. Okay. So the mission of Minnesota Foster and Adoptive Families is uh, standing to empower foster and adoptive families by providing whole family support to meet immediate needs and by being a voice for change. So empowerment is a big concept for us, empowering foster and adoptive families. Well, how do you do that? How do we wanna do that? So we wanna support the family's um, immediate needs and to be a voice for change. And so like every mission statement, you know, it's broad, but we think it's focused enough to, to keep our attention focused on meeting the immediate needs of foster families um, so I, I liken this to, um, kind of, a you know, Maslon's hierarchy of needs, you know, people have, um, they got to eat, right? <laughs> and this, the day-to-day, -day, uh, supports the foster families needs like car seats, diapers, uh, clothing for kids. Um, those are some of the things that we're, we're thinking about 
immediate needs. We're talking about tangible needs. Uh, so when you become a foster parent and the county calls you up, your license, okay, I've got a sibling group of three kids and you know maybe they're not their bedrooms not set up the, you know they need to be ready to take these kids in um, so that's one focus of the the program and then the other um, concept you know as i mentioned being a, a voice for change at the legislature um, you know we didn't want this to be just me mark fiddler and kathy gilman and the, the handful of people that are um, on our board, we wanted it to speak from a, a broad base of grassroots support from actual um, foster and adoptive parents. And so the idea was, uh, is to link together the foster closet program that we have um, with the advocacy program. And so, um, and our vision was to transform the lives of children and uh, communities in care and that communities are unified in their commitment to foster and adopt the families and that they have access to inclusive advocacy supports and resources. So that's our mission and vision. Um, so where did this come from uh, and why do we need an organization like this? So we did uh, a lot of research and there's um, multiple studies, uh, maybe Rich has seen them, that go back into the 90s that talk uh, about one, the shortage of foster parents. Well, how come people aren't just going gangbusters to become foster parents? Well, there's, lim there's problems. <laughs> the, so the turnover rate of foster parents, uh, I'm trying to pin this data down, uh, 30 to 50% turnover. So um, I believe that's, I'm not quite sure the, the time frame within which that 30 to 50% <laughs> happens, but whether it's a year or two years, it's really, really high. And so you can imagine what it would mean if you're a foster parent after a year or two years and you decide um, you can't handle it anymore, you're not feeling supported, you don't have a voice, uh, so you quit. That means children are displaced and then the kids have to go to another foster home. And if they're fortunate, maybe that family will feel better supported um, uh, and the child will, you know, won't be bounced around. But, uh, but we do know that the, the instability, the, the lack of retention of foster parents leads to um, foster placement instability for children, and, which is bad for them and it interrupts those attachments. Um, so the study, um, on this link down below, it's it's kind of a lay written article, but it talks about some of the data about why uh, the, some of the problems that foster parents face. They, as you would imagine, uh, have uh, they suffer feelings of grief and loss. If you've got a foster child. I mean, some of it's necessary. You know, when you support reunification, the children will go back to their their families of origin, and there's understandable grief and loss there, but that is what it is. Um, maybe they've um, had a broken attachment like my clients where they were going to be the permanency option and bladed relative searches uh, interrupted that. Um, most the, the the data I've seen uh, indicate that foster parents don't feel supported by their caseworker or agency. There's a lack of communication. Um, a minority of foster parents surveyed stated they felt that they were included in decision making of the child regarding uh, regarding the child being placed in their home. Um, every case plan I've seen has a box for supposedly talking to foster parents about the ch children's needs. Um, that isn't always um, the case. And lastly, um, a lack of training and resources for foster parents. And this last bullet is what we're um, deciding to focus on right now. I mean, there's um, a lot of things we could do. We could do training. There's other organizations that are doing training. Um, we're not right now licensed trainers. We don't have licensed trainers, um, but we do, we can focus on the resources. So our initial um, program full focus is on the foster closet program. 
Um, so what do we plan to do? So we're going to empower, foster, and adoptive families by, and these are our goals for the next three years, um, technical assistance and financial support to open three new foster closets annually. That's just a minimum. And in a few minutes, Alicia is going to tell you, maybe you don't know what a foster closet is. Um, and then uh, we're going to help um, form local in-kind partnerships and spon sponsorships uh, to support those foster closets from local um, institutions, maybe a ta Target or Walmart or Chamber of Commerce, whatnot. Um, and then the, the end point, uh, the idea is with, okay, we meet immediate needs, we can help organize um, foster uh, parents and adoptive parents through the closet network. And these, all these closets have a network that's kind of built in. Um, and that we would be that voice uh, for change. Um, we would train the, the members on advocacy, like how do you talk to a legislator? Um, we disseminate informational materials. Um, and um, so the goal is to endorse at least one initiative of a partner organization in year one. So maybe we work with safe passages on a bill that they have in mind or Aspire or National Association, uh, NACAC. I forgot what that, that exactly stands for now, but um, so our, we're intending to be partners with other organizations, um, have our membership support those partner organizations, and then um, as we get more fully ramped up, um, uh, we hope to be in a position to actually have our own uh, legislation authored and introduced by the 2024 session. So that's kind of the big picture. Um, and I think at this point, um, I'll turn it over to uh, Alicia and then I'll, I'm gonna follow up after Alicia talks about her organization and what a closet is. And then I'm gonna, uh, I'd like to uh, just spend a few minutes talking about how we form partnerships, um, like some of the legalities of doing that. So just unmute yourself, uh, Alicia. Hello. Um, so I guess for starters, I think the big part is probably just addressing in general what a foster closet is. Um, so as a foster provider myself, one of the things that I've ran into quite a few times is kids come into placement and they have literally nothing. Um, many of us know these stories. We know they're out there. Um, they're in my area. We have to drive roughly 45 minutes to an hour to be able to hit a, a typical or like more well-known um, local foster closet. At these said closets, they might be a different organization. They might be even at some of the local counties, um, churches, but typically they provide um, basic clothing for kiddos, you know, whether it be just a couple of nights or a week's worth. Um, and again, that in my area, we felt like we were having to drive quite a ways. Um, I was sitting in one of my county's trainings one day and the parents were kind of all complaining, you know, our kids all need these winter items, stuff like that. Um, I just kind of had said like, well, let's do something about it. Um, so Moving Mountains then started out um, as a mountain of winter gear in my basement. Um, it turned into, we now provide um, clothing and toiletries to 13 different counties, North Metro area of Minnesota. Um, we mostly run off of like referrals from our county. So like working directly with social workers, caseworkers, guardian items, um, even some of the biological families get the resources to reach out to us. Um, and it will provide obviously the clothing and whatever kind of they need. Sorry, my cat's going crazy at my feet. <laughs> um, but then we also help a lot of just basic families in the community as well. So it's a little different than a lot of your typical foster closets. A lot of the closets help only kiddos in care. Um, we do strive to kind of help everybody. If you need help, you need help. Um, but with definite, you know, seniority on, on the kiddos in care. Um, I forget kind of everything that you guys wanted me to talk about. Sorry, bear with me. Um, so, you know, I feel like a lot of the questions I get when people ask what Moving Mountains is, how does it work? Um, so I run solely off of donations. Um, everything comes into a giant bin outside of my pole barn currently. Um, a lot of people just know the, know the address, know where they can drop off. Um, we accept anything gently used, merely new, um, or brand new items, of course. Um, 
So people will drop off literally in this bin. The bin then I take things um, now actually in, in a little short bus. I purchased a bus to be able to transport these items um, to a warehouse that's about 20 minutes away from me. Um, there things are sorted kind of by age, gender, things like that. Um, when a referral comes in, then either myself or volunteers will help pack boxes. Um, so the box is pre-packed for a kiddo. Um, we typically will ask like, you know, do they have a favorite color, favorite character, you know, so it's not packed, you know, months in advance type thing. It's definitely just packed like as the kiddo's request has come in. Um, and then it's either arranged that they can pick up from the warehouse, they can pick up from my personal home. Um, a lot of times the caseworkers and stuff, I'll just th deal with them directly. Um, especially some of the further counties, I've got a couple caseworkers who are up, you know, near Duluth. Um, I'm actually, I'm located in Princeton, so Duluth is about mm, two hours from me. Um, but there's a few caseworkers who will like once a month swing by and just grab oodles of boxes for me at once to bring up there. Um, so it's definitely become a, a pretty huge train of people to get this all to work, to get all over these counties. Um, but I mean, it's, there's obviously a need there and these people need these things. So um, donations wise, again, that, you know, partnering with MINFAF um, as a board member and stuff. And then I also partnered with them under Moving Mountains to be able to utilize some of the, the nonprofit status. Um, so of course, getting that benefit piece to potentially pair up with some retailers and things like that to ultimately benefit the kids in the long run too. Um, I do get a lot of stuff donated in. I feel like things that come in are just as fastly going out, um, but there's definitely a struggle too where I'm constantly having to post like, hey guys, I'm looking for this, I'm looking for that. Um, I know right now I just had my packing list for this weekend, for example, I've, I've got winter gear that's got to go out. Winter gear is it's a pretty big one around here. And there's 36 kids just this weekend that I need to pack for that are full winter gear. Um, mostly just within like a surrounding, you know, three, four counties from Mille Lacs, Sherman, right? Um, and then I see any county, but there's still that spread of the full 13 counties. Um, then with MINFAF, we're looking to try to be able to have more closets out there. Um, we do have another partner currently. Um, she's located up kind of near Alexandria. Um, super small county and, you know, prefers to keep it that way. Um, but we're forever looking to start more closets elsewhere um, so people aren't having to drive. Um, you know, there's, as we all know, again, a lot of the times these families, you know, suddenly, hey, if, can you can you take this kid out? Yep, sure can, but you might not have the things that they need. Can you make it to the store? Um, sometimes there's, some of us have, you know, a ton of kids in your house and it's really difficult to make that quick Walmart run to even grab diapers or whatever need be or in the middle of the night. Um, and yeah, that's where obviously Mountains comes in. Um, I think partnering with other closets around the state in general. Um, we've tried to reach out to a couple other um, current closets and stuff, but it sounds like there's really just not anything out there. Um, so just hoping to kind of broaden the horizons and honestly, just get more closets out there for the more support for the foster families. Alicia, I've got a question. So um, so is the, the foster care payments that they get from the county, uh, is that, that's not adequate to cover the costs of the care for the children. So like if they need a winter coats or car seats, uh, et cetera, et cetera, the, the payment doesn't cover that? Um, absolutely not. Um, you'll see me smirk there, sorry. Uh, but no, there's, especially if you're somebody too, if you need to have your kiddo put into daycare or anything like that, like there's no, there's absolutely no way. Um, I guess I feel like with a lot of the infants and stuff that have been in my care, that basic daily rate doesn't even cover their, their general diapers and formula wipes, you know, even if they get wick for their formula, you know, so then they're growing so fast, you know, next thing you know, you got to maybe buy two coats in a, a six month period for winter. And, you know, how many other kids do you have in your home? And you no, know, there's, there's most definitely not enough funding under those basic MAPSI payments for these kiddos. Mm -hmm. um, there is clothing allowances that are obviously given out a lot of times by counties or agencies, um, but you're only able to utilize those once. So, you know, if your kid comes into basic care right off the bat and they, are able to spend $300 on clothes, they again might outgrow those clothes in just a couple of months. Um, so I think that's probably a pretty big one. I, I feel like a lot of my foster providers now will actually like trade clothes back. Um, so like a lot of them even right now as we're like swapping out winter gear, they're picking up winter gear for their kids so that at the same time as their drop-offs or pickups are happening, they're just redonating back stuff from last year that's still perfectly usable. Um, but yeah, there's, there's definitely not enough funding in there. Okay, um, well then what I'd like to do is uh, talk about some of the logistics. Uh, so if anybody's wondering, um, you know, what does it mean to be a partnership and what's in it for the closet? Um, uh, 
here's your chance to find out. Uh, let's see. So I apologize for being a lawyer. I like um, legal documents. <laughs> so I tried to keep this one simple to um, talk about. Uh, so if you want to be a closet, uh, like Moving Mountains, uh, the, we have another one in Grant County. Um, so the idea of um, the, the, the partnership program is that MINFAF um, would be like an umbrella organization. So let's say you wanted to get donations from a local um, foundation or Target or Fleet Farm or whatever for your local closet. You know, you'd have to tell them, they're going to say, are you a 501c3 organization? And you'd say, well, what's that? And no, I'm not. And so, I mean, that means incorporating with the state of Minnesota. Uh, it's a cumbersome incorporation. There's special language you have to have, then you have to go through the IRS process. So, I mean, it can take a long time to have a board of directors. Um, so what uh, we are offering closets is the idea of being an umbrella. So if they partner with us uh, and sign a partnership agreement, um, then every donation they get or that we get on their behalf would be tax deductible. And then they can also make purchases through our sales tax exemption. So if you're trying to buy closets or a uh, little shelving or whatever, um, you know, paint, you know, that's tax exempt. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's, I won't go into all the other details, but also any, uh, so the closets would be a, a one, one way for members to join MINFAF who are interested in lobbying and advocacy. So they would come in through different doors. So there's the foster closets um, and we have, uh, we're building out, we're just, we're still a baby organization. So be patient with us. So in, in December, we're going to have a website so people can join on the, through the website. Um, and then closet users can access our, um, uh, it's a, what do you call it? Uh, Salsa Labs. It's a database customer uh, relations management software. So we can stay in touch with them, tell them about legislation. Um, foster clear, foster closet issues, opportunities. Um, so then what the closet has to do is they have to um, simply file with the uh, Secretary of State. They have to have a, a certain kind of um, articles of incorporation that state that they're affiliated with us and they are supervised and controlled by us. That's not as onerous as it would sound and I won't go into all the details. Um, but yeah, so um, that, that's the idea of forming the, those are, that's, those are some of the nuts and bolts about becoming a closet uh, and being affiliated with Minnesota foster and adoptive families. So what do we want to do? So one of the things that I've been dreaming about, um, you know, Kathy, our board chair, um, you know, she's been pushing PCA services, you know, increasing uh, awareness and funding for PCA services. I, I work in different states. Um, I know foster parents often don't have standing uh, what, or what they call their right to speak in court as a party. Um, so Wisconsin, I know, has like, for instance, a, um, a provision that allows foster parents to um, file an objection to a change of placement. Uh, and it's, it's a formal process for them to do that. Here, you're lucky to be heard on that issue if you're a foster parent. Um, and there's all manner of um, issues, that, um, you know, areas of improvement in the, the child welfare system. But anyway, that those are some of the, the thoughts we have. I mean, overall, our, our guiding principle is the best interest of the child and, and they come first. So um, I think I'm right at 3.01, so that's over 30 minutes, Rich, so how do you do? <laughs> that, that's great. Well, and I see one or two questions. Um, why don't we start out with the one that's in the chat room, and I, I have one, and others may have. So um, can you see that question from Mark Lupin? Uh, I can read it if you like. Mark says, I've read from tribal organizations that many of their kids sent to foster 
families are not tribal members and they end up in a quote white family permanently. Why would Native Americans, Native American foster families not be readily available uh, or even other racial groups? Why the mismatch? And yeah, well, yeah, well, we've talked about the shortage of foster families in general, you know, quality fat families in general. It's more of a challenge in the Indian community. So there has been for decades a, a chronic shortage of um, foster families for Native American children. And under the Indian Child Welfare Act, the preference is that children be placed first with relatives. And so they can get um, licensed uh, by the tribe or by the county. Um, but even with the, the family and native foster homes, there just aren't enough. So um, if children are to be protected, they have to be placed outside of um, uh, the, the, the tribal home. So, and unfortunately when they bond and attach as children. I mean, that's their job, uh, right? <laughs> of developing de de child development. Um, you know, when a native home is found, uh, the shortage, the chronic shortage just sets up a lot of instability. Um, and I, I just looked at some recent data that Indian children constitute the largest segment of kids who've been in placement for over two years. Um, so I know that's you know, part of the process of looking for an Indian home, well, it means they stay in care, uh, foster care longer than any other race. Uh, I have a question on that. Would that, uh, is lack of resources the big issue, one of the big problems in tribal situations? I, I, I don't, I don't, I haven't seen data on that. I, I couldn't tell you, Mark. I, I can only surmise. Um, you know, the tribe's license, so, I mean, they get, so, like, so Alicia just told us that, uh, so for your non, for, for families in general, uh, foster care is, is really expensive, and most families can't meet the needs economically. Well, I would, I would imagine, like, if you're even more um, financially on edge, it's going to be a super challenge uh, to take kids into care and be able to afford it. So, I... I don't know if it's an economic, I would surmise it's a, an economic issue. So you haven't talked with any specific tribes on what could change to facilitate that? Well, they've all been uh, redoubling their efforts. Uh, I mean, every tribe um, will tell you that they have a program to increase family uh, uh, foster care. Um, and it just, it's, they're really struggling. Okay, thank you. Yep. Other questions? I was going to say, it seems like one obvious thing, if you get an association of foster parents really rolling, the, maybe the first thing on the list is to advocate for increases in the daily rate and the foster care rates, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, and, I, and, and that's also like a, a federal question too, because most of the uh, I, I'm not sure what the breakdown is anymore, but um, I thought it was uh, half of the, there's federal financial participation for foster care. Uh, so the county pays part and the state pays part and the feds pay a big chunk. Right, but I think that, I don't know, that's, I don't think that's as much of a problem because um, essentially once you set a rate, it's an entitlement program and the federal government's required to pay half the cost. So I think the, the resistance would come from the state and the right. county have to pay the other half. Most right. counties, um, yeah. So uh, that, that should be relatively straightforward. Not easy, but straightforward. Yeah, well, just anecdotally, I know that, um, like if you're from a wealthy county, like say Washington, um, you know, you're gonna, I think the payments are higher than a poorer county, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I actually want to chime in a little bit on that piece, Mark. Um, so as a foster provider in Mille Lacs County um, and also Sherburne County, I just kind of swapped um, boundary lines here. I do know, so I, I actually take in um, highly medically fragile kiddos, um, trachs, G-tubes, feeding tubes, uh, you know, oxygen dependent, things like that. Um, and one of the things that we as providers who have kind of banded together have noticed is that, yes, there is drastically different um, payments that are received um, for kiddos who maybe have the exact same needs um, based off of county to county. So I think that's something that 
definitely yes speaks volumes that it, it it is based off of some of the funding within each county too and who's willing to to give different rates to different kids and how all that looks right there's a common rate structure that the state sets up but it's implemented differently by different counties is that is that correct yeah, I mean, I think it's probably based off of who who's doing the MAPSI screening on each child. So a lot of times you have a caseworker who comes out and does that. Um, I guess I feel like for in in my experience, um, it's a huge struggle that there isn't anybody out there to advocate for these kids who have these significant medical needs. So you have a caseworker who's coming in who maybe knows about basic bumps, bruises, things like that, doesn't understand the high needs that these kids have, whether it be medical or behavioral. Um, and and if they, you know, I, I think everybody kind of knows a MAPSI scale goes off of the letter you know, where they might not see the need there um, as, as strongly as somebody else. So it really depends on who's who's doing the assessment to begin with, where it's not, yeah. it, it should be kind of fair across the board, but it, it's, it's definitely not. Uh, if I can jump in here too. So each child comes in with a basic rate and then they're, um, they go into the, the letter on how they're graded. And for myself with my um, foster kids, the mental health, now Alicia does a lot of uh, medically fragile. So that could fit into you know, the, the DOC points, but the mental health issues are what I've been fighting for for years because a lot of our MAPSIs don't um, fit the mental health. And um, so another thing that I kind of wanted to talk about too was on the clothing allowance. Um, when you get a child in, they do get a clothing allowance. But if that child has been in another foster home and that clothing allowance was used in that other foster home, you don't get a clothing allowance. It's a one time clothing allowance so um it's per child per child one time per child and my uh, first placements I got four children <laughs> and they grew I was supposed to have them for a weekend and I had them for eight and a half months nine and a half months and um obviously needed that clothing allowance that I couldn't get hmm. so one of the things that I'm really excited about with the foster closets um, is a lot of the um, people that come to the foster closets, they're looking for answers, they're looking for help because they haven't been able to get um, a lot of the support from within the system. And that's kind of why this need is so great. Um, and the advocacy piece is also such a huge part is um, I get calls all the time from foster parents and people in the system that said, I don't know what to do. And as you know, Rich, over the years, I've reached out to you when I've hit roadblocks because in, in um, it's not always a, a great situation that our children are in. And I've, I've had to try to even protect my kids from the system at times. So it, it's uh, it's good, but it needs a lot of work. Greg, were you and I just want to see there's another comment or question, but Greg uh, is a retired child protection supervisor. And I saw you about to jump in. Um, yeah, I was going to yeah. talk about the payment and Kathy kind of, covered it is it's a two-part uh, formula. There's the base rate that is set by the state that every child going into placement receives based on the age brackets. And then there's the difficulty of care, as Kathy said, the DOC rate. And that is um, unique to each child. And there's a rating sheet that is filled out. And that's where you get the variability is on the difficulty of care rate. But the base rate is established uniformly across the state. It's just a, if but there's no... The, go, but, uh, but does the county have to chip in money and that kind of throws a big monkey, monkey wrench yeah. in the system when they don't pay, the feds don't pay? Right. That's, that's why I understand it. It's a county-based system. So if you have a poor county, you have Hennepin County, when they ran into trouble with court case, they put $75 million of their own money into child protection and foster care. Uh, if you're, you know, um, you know, uh, some, you know, small county upstate or something like that or downstate, you may not, one kid going into residential treatment could break the budget. So it's very much, it's like property taxes. It's very much dependent upon the, uh, the property tax base of a particular county. So this is a very political issue. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a budget issue, which is always a political issue. And, and different counties have different resources. So there's not a consistent availability of money across the state. 
Is there is there a way, Mark, to uh, lobby for better training or state standards in some of this stuff? Um, it's pretty discouraging to hear what you're all going through just to open your hearts and your homes to children who are in desperate need of them. I mean, we have a surplus in this state, right? Shouldn't that some of that go to foster care? Absolutely. Well, that's where the politics comes in. So there shouldn't be such a, well, there shouldn't, right. There shouldn't be such, such a difference among counties. I mean, kids are kids and kids have basic needs, more than basic needs, clearly. Right. It, you know, again, so like, are, do you have a team of folks that are lobbying, Mark, or how does that work? Um, right now, we don't have anybody. <laughs> Uh, well, well, we have our board of directors and we have me, um, but I'm a firm believer in um, the power in numbers and um, also accountability. So, so we, uh, I, I have been a lobbyist. I was a lobbyist for actually for DHS, the, the state agency, um, and I lobbied for the state bar. So mm -hmm. I, I would be one of the lobbying trainers, um, but we need uh, members. We want to build up our membership to have a, a credible voice. So if I've got a bill, I, I want to um, be able to tap into members from all over the state who are constituents, you know, so they can contact their legislator with, um, you know, uh, su requesting support for a bill. And a lot of foster parents are afraid to speak up. In, in order to make changes, we have to hear the voices of the, the people that are doing the hands-on care. Um, and a lot of foster parents are strongly discouraged and... Um, some pretty nasty things have even happened, including myself when I did speak up because we are expected to stay in our lane. <laughs> and um, and uh, it, it gets, it's pretty dirty sometimes. And it's very scary, some of the things that, that happen. You know, they threaten to take our foster kids away and all kinds of things. Um, they stopped giving me children at one point because I spoke up and, and um, yeah, so. so so just a little context, you know, right. that I think Kathy and I first started approaching foundations about the need for a foster parent association probably 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Mark and, and Kathy and Alicia finally pulled it off and got a little bit of money. And I think the goal is not just to, to do foster closets by themselves, but also use that as, tell me if I've got this right to Mark and Alicia, kind of a rallying point for foster parents to get together and to start talking and then to develop some power base, some, a voice mm -hmm. where it can be heard. So the phrase I heard a lot is what Kathy just said, stay in your lane. Foster parents are told to stay in your lane and not expected to be a participating right. member. There is an initiative statewide, I'm not gonna remember the name of it, that um, Aspire, which is a, an association of, of uh, you know, child welfare agencies is, um, putting together which is a national model and would involve, um, they, they do involve foster parents in the case planning and, and all that sort of thing. Does anybody know the name of what I'm talking about? We did actually had a presentation on it once and I'm just blocking on it. But there is an effort to, to, to improve the quality of foster care by using a model that does involve foster parents. So, you know, hopefully that'll get some. Mm -hmm. uh, question I want to ask Alicia, it sounds you have just a lot of people in a broad span and one thing you said is you, you tried to link up with other foster closets and there wasn't much there do you mean they don't have the capacity to work with others or they just aren't there aren't any um, i think there's a little bit of both um so i think definitely that there isn't any is a is a huge one um there's some organizations and some of there who are willing to help you know like i had mentioned like sometimes there'll be different churches and stuff who will maybe have you know, a, a small variety of bins or things that would be available to foster families, but they're not directly, like, I'm, I'm going to say advertising or like out there that like every foster parent knows in that, you know, county area, if I get a kiddo and need something, this is where I go or who I call. Um, ultimately, I mean, it would be, you know, if we could have some sort of closet set up like that within a, you know, 30 mile radius or something of every basic licensing county would be amazing. Um, but right now there's just, there's just not.
I'm, I'm curious if uh, networking with groups like Minnesota Academy of Pediatrics, which has their own, and MMA, has, have their own medical lobbyists, can help you in something like that. Does that, does that make sense? I've never... Uh... Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, what... Um... You know, all of us, want, we're champing at the bit and we there's bills that we want to introduce and, but, you know, we want to build up the organization first. So we've got credibility when we do go there. But, but I know, for instance, um, I, I work with a lot of experts in the area of um, uh, psychiatry and uh, psychology, you know, everybody who knows anything about child development uh, knows the importance of uh, attachment theory you know, for kids who are placed in foster care and adoption. I mean, it's this idea that, um, you know, your brain is hardwired to develop um, connections with your caregiver. And when, and when those connections are severed after being established for a year or two years, I mean, it can lead to lifelong profound damage to the child's ability to, you know, form relationships with adults. And so, I mean, I knew that, I know that there are experts in the field who would um, support us. Like we just wanted to have a bill that would say, you know, if you're gonna, the, believe it or not, the best interest of the child standard in Minnesota does not require the court to consider the child's attachment history. And other states, oh, they, that's yeah. such a basic thing. You get, the court has to le it, it, it even ask about it and make findings about it attachment mm. but that but so depending on the issue you know a group right. like that would be absolutely critical you know thank you so here's what the experts say mark i'm just curious in the very beginning you were talking about the situation where you know a relative came in kind of at the last minute and the court placed with the relative um i worked at hennepin county in child protection for 37 years and I did not work in the ICWA section, so I do not have as much knowledge of the ICWA Act, but I'm certainly familiar with the basics of it. But even in the non-ICWA cases, we saw that fairly regularly where it was like a relative could come into the situation in the permanency part of the case at almost any point. And the court would typically respond by saying, well, the statute obligated them to consider the relative. From your point of view as a lawyer and you who worked on these cases, is that a proper application of the law or is that something else going on? Because I saw it happen consistently in the non-equal cases and in talking to my colleagues in the equal section, they saw it happen there a lot too. And it was always the same answer is that the law requires us to give consideration to the relative, no matter what stage of the process the case is at. Yeah, so great, uh, great question. So the, as you know, the, the devil is in the details. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so when the law says that a relative is, so the law literally says, it used to say the court, shall, the court and ag agency shall prefer uh, placement with relatives first and then they took out the word preference in the early 90s yeah um, and then changed it to consider so then it said the agency shall consider in the following order of pre in, in the following order so it, the word preference is gone but you know change dice you know change comes hard and slow so it's still in most minds of social workers and judges child protection workers there's still this kind of primitive idea of relative uh, relatives always come first no matter what. But, but the law says that the agency is supposed to consider placement with the, the relative, but uh, always consistent with the best interests of the child. And that's where you get this tension between, um, you know, this desire to place with relatives first and how do you balance that against the best inter interests of the child if the child has got, you know, a long-term attachment with a caregiver. And so the, the pendulum, I mean, it's, a, it's really a, a big social, uh, cultural, ideological issue that's just gone. The pendulum has swung back and forth over the last 20, 30 years, you know, between 
pro relative relatives are always uh, preferred <laughs> to foster parents being preferred. Now we're in kind of a, a, a swing back to uh, relative um, relative priority almost. So, 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 so other states like uh, I actually wrote a bill um, just last year that's kind of sitting on my shelf. Uh, and we copied the language from uh, Georgia. So Georgia said, uh, okay, the, we want to have a, um, a really aggressive upfront relative search and not wait till after the rights are terminated, but right out of the gate, do a really detailed, uh, thorough relative search. And then, um, you know, so then after six months, the court checks in with the county, okay, how's that going? So, well, no, Your Honor, we still can't find anybody. Then at that point, there's a presumption that the child uh, should stay with his current provider. Um, so it, it kind of puts an end point on the, the search for, for relatives. But, yeah. Did you see that application of the law vary from county to county? Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. You know, so county agencies are, uh, like any agency, you know, they, there's a term in uh, agency law called uh, being, becoming captives. So the agency can become a captive of different uh, constituency groups, you know, whether it's tribal or uh, uh, relative advocates, father's rights advocates. Um, so the, the counties are political agencies and, you know, they're, they're all... They, they listen to those constituencies and some counties are pro relative and others aren't. And just anecdotally, I'd also say from my experience in Hennepin County, it varied from judge to judge as well. Yep. So, anyway. I'm glad you asked that because it's really, I just thought it was pretty much in the law. I didn't realize it was almost more custom than the law and the law actually reads a little bit the other way, but. Uh, it does make sense. You get some momentum on a current uh, way of looking at the world, and it's very hard to redirect that over time. Mm -hmm. I think the more knowledge that, you know, the system learns, like, you know, Mark said about, um, both Marks, about the um, attachment issue is so important because I've seen that in so many of my children, you know, that uh, have been placed in so many different homes and and that brain development is uh, prefrontal lobe is really gets damaged a lot when that trauma hits them. Right. I mean, there's so much emphasis. Uh, you know, if you talk with legislators or others, speaking of people kind of going one direction, what you hear about is a trauma of removing children from their bio families. Uh, you almost never hear about the trauma of removing, of leaving children where they are, you know. They're rotting in their crib. I mean, it's it's like not a factor. They don't talk about that. Or if the kid's really being, you know, be badly beaten or sex trapped or whatever, you know, trauma of leaving kids uh, where they are. And you also hear about the trauma, and this is where I think uh, Mark is going a lot, is um, the trauma of uh, moving a child who's bonded with a foster parent. And that's, I think that's a major mission in life for you, Mark, but, um, those things you start talking about, it's, it's talking about the trauma of removing them from bio parents. Right. Um, Alicia, I have one other question. I just got the sense of the scope of your operation. Do you have numbers on like how many foster children or foster parents you serve say in a year, something like that? I wish I could give you a super updated um, number, but I know back in like July, it was we were up to about 700. Um, so I mean, but some... And some of it might just be minimal, like some, it might just be a child who just needs a pair of shoes. Um, however, it could be a child who, you know, needs a full, you know, two weeks worth of clothing came with nothing. Um, but yeah, it was up to about 700 when we were working on some moving that we were doing. Um, and that's just for 2021 so far? Correct. Yeah. Oh. Correct. Wow, that is big. It's, it's, it's a bit chaotic. <laughs> Alicia has a lot of energy. <laughs> you, you probably know every shoe. That's so nice. Yeah, so Alicia is our model. So we are um, wanting to, I mean, she's just a pro at this and she's just a wealth of uh, resources and technical uh, expertise to, so we just wanna 
do what she's doing all over the state and then organize them to become advocates for kids. So we appreciate, really appreciate everybody listening. And, and thank you guys for what you do. Thank you all, absolutely. We have one more question from Mark Lupin about opioids. Oh, you say that, yeah. You responded to that, but I don't know. Yeah. All right. Can I ask one more? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, uh, the drug charges, are these related to people convicted going to prison or uh, drug charges pending court proceedings? Well, you could have like a, a, a drug exposed baby, so there's no, no conviction. Um, we see a lot of those uh, referrals from the hospital. You know, I, I'm in, I do private adoptions and there's, I see too many of those. It's just anecdotal data, but yeah. Uh, yeah. What about beyond uh, beyond birth? You know, I don't I don't know that data, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Um, Just to be I'll chime in as as some unprofessional data that uh, <laughs> every child who's been placed in my home over the last five years, there is drug involvement of some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. um, keeping in mind that a good majority of my kids are high medical needs, um, things like that. So I don't know if that's something that runs hand in hand that parents who are maybe under a significant amount of stress. Um, maybe the drugs come into play, but yeah, it's, it's definitely been with every single kiddo. There's mm -hmm. some sort of drug relation going on there. Okay. Thank you. I'd, I'd second that because of the, over the 50 kids I had over half were drugs and it was not just mom and dad, it was grandma and grandpa, aunts, uncles. It was pretty much, uh, in the family. Well, there you go. <laughs> and, and drug treatment is not very available. And, and unfortunately, meth brain is not enough studies. They do the, the AFS, alcohol fetal syndrome brain, you know, has a lot of studies. But, you know, personally, what I'm dealing with right now is, is a child with meth brain. And she doesn't fit in the box. So I'm just going to say, because I have a hard stop at uh, 3.30, but you don't have to, you don't have to leave. But I just want to say thank you to Mark and Alicia. It's been really informative. And, you know, maybe we can work on attachment theory at some point in the legislature or something like that. Uh, some of those issues where we all care about it. And Association of Pediatricians, Minnesota Association Academy of Pediatricians might, would be a great ally in that. So yeah. thank you for showing up. And i just going to go on mute, but you all can continue if you want. And um, Stephanie, I'm going to leave it to you to end it, okay, when it's time, whenever everybody's ready to end. Yeah, well, thank you, Rich, and, and I, I love the idea of that uh, attachment theory um, legislation, uh, collaboration, whatever, and I do have a hard stop. I'm going up to our Lake Superior home for the long weekend, so I have to leave at 3.30. Good for you. Thank you all.